Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. We've been made painfully aware of our vulnerabilities as a nation and as a city, from both without and within, for more years than we'd like to acknowledge. We've learned that we can't take freedom for granted, but what price do we have to pay for it? It's a question Donna Lieberman grapples with every day. She's been executive director of the New York Civil Liberties Union since 2001, but she's been tilting at legal windmills since long before that. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Donna, there was a very disturbing incident at a New York, at a, Brook, a housing project in Brooklyn um, last week where a 28-year-old Akai Gurley, an unarmed black man, was shot in the stairwell of uh, a building. And I mean, th th there are three things that stand by, by a New York City cop. Um, and three things stand out for me. Um, one, because of the poor maintenance in the housing projects, the stairwell was dark. The light had been out for some time. He was only taking the stairs because the elevator was out again. Um, and the cop who shot him, who was doing a routine, what they call a vertical patrol of the building, was walking with his gun in his hand. And it, it just seems like it's just a perfect setup for disaster, which it was. Um, does anything about this incident raise any civil liberties issues in your mind? Hmm. <laughs> does it? Um, uh, you know, what happened um, is, you know, another tragic and uh, senseless and probably avoidable killing um, that is, has destroyed one life and will likely um, seriously seriously impair the life of the officer involved as well. You don't recover from something like that, and, and at least not easily, um, not to mention the family um, of the young man who was killed. And, you know, actually, Cheryl, you're the first person who starts a conversation about what happened here with the physical conditions in the housing project. It is absolutely, um, uh, crazy and so irresponsible that 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 in a in a building that is known to be uh, at risk of crime uh, known to be dangerous um, the maintenance is not seen to in a way that will reduce the risk of criminal activity going on um, would that have prevented the killing? Who knows? But like, why is the city not doing everything in its power to ensure that every stairwell is lit? Why is it not doing everything in its power to ensure that the elevators work? It's like, you know, um, people, you know, trespassing in the building, you know, and you find out that the locks don't work. You, do you go for a security guard or do you fix the lock? And, 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 um, and then, the issue of the vertical patrols, you know, vertical patrols have long been a source of um, criticism um, from the communities that, is, that are subjected to them. Vertical patrols, you know, have cops in, in, in public housing um, uh, to, to help presumably protect, protect the people residents. who live there and their guests. But over the years, there, there have been lots of abuses, lots of complaints of unlawful stops, uh, unlaw unlawful frisks, and, and unlawful trespass arrests. And it's the subject of a class action lawsuit that's an accompaniment to the Floyd case and the Lagon case um, that dealt with stop and frisk. So it's, it, but, but, you know, one of the issues that appears to jump off the page here, regardless of the details of what happened in that stairwell, why is it that the police department is sending rookie cops into the most dangerous uh, situations, the, one, the situations that require perhaps the most training and sophistication? You know, why is it that, 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 that um, rookies um, are using you know, sort of like the most vulnerable populations as kind of the guinea pigs. And why are cops doing these routine patrols with guns drawn? 
absolutely no excuse for that if that's what happened. There's, a, there's much that's to be learned about the facts here, um, but, but I think this is a situation that cries out for a re-examination of how the police conduct the vertical patrols in public housing, how they do their job, and how the, and what the responsibility in safety um, is of the maintenance of uh, the, the, those responsible for, for maintenance, the, the city housing authority. Right. While we're talking about the police, um, last year, um, Judge Shira Scheinlin ruled that the NYPD's, the way it was administering its stop and frisk uh, was unconstitutional because it disproportionately targeted uh, black and Latino males. Has anything improved since then, or are they stopping and frisking just like they used to, or have there been improvements in response to that? No, actually, um, uh, much has changed since then. Um, the numbers of stop and frisks have gone way, way down from a high of almost 700,000 uh, to um, a number that's on target for about 50,000 this year. Oh, really? But the question is, and so that's progress. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the racial disparities continue, but the impact of those disparities is far reduced when the numbers are so uh, far down. But I think we have concerns about whether there are other practices of the police department um, that are uh, improperly targeting people of color and subjecting them to a different type of law enforcement than white people are. And that's the issue of the enforcement, um, excessive enforcement, I believe, um, of low level offenses. You know, marijuana is the poster child for that. You know, there, there, there in the past year were um, on nearly 30,000 marijuana arrests. The police department thinks it's great that they have reduced the number of marijuana arrests, you know, in the past year um, slightly. But, but actually, you know, in the 90s, they were like 3,000 a year. So, so it may be down, but it's not down far enough. We're pleased that the mayor announced a program of, of issuing summonses in, in some of the marijuana instead cases. Instead of arrests. Instead of arrests, but that comes with its whole uh, other set of, of, of uh, collateral consequences for people. It certainly doesn't wipe out the damage to somebody who's an immigrant who, regardless of the amount, um, uh, two convictions for marijuana is automatic deportation. So, so, so it, it's, it's um, uh, you know, while white people are f more frequent users of marijuana, people of color make up 90% of the arrests. We don't know what percentage of summonses um, they make up because the police department doesn't keep that data. Mm -hmm. So we have been pressing with the police department and we're hopeful that they will actually record the data on these and all summonses that are issued. So under the new procedure, if you get a summons for marijuana, can you just send in a check the way you did, you, you can for a parking ticket and pay it off, or do you have to go to court at some no, point? No, you have to go to court, and, and it's, you know, some court. <laughs> it's, you know, 346 Broadway, which is summons court, which is, you know, kind of, kind of sort of an assembly line. And, and um, uh, also people who, um, um, you stand a far better chance of getting your case dismissed if you go to court. Uh, then what's the alternative um, to losing a day of pay to go to court? Let's say we're a day of school. Um, the alternative is a bench warrant. If you don't appear in court, you get a bench warrant. And so you could still wind up getting arrested for it. Which right? means that you would ultimately get arrested. Right. So, so, you know, we hope that the city will take measures to um, reduce the likelihood of somebody getting a bench warrant, um, giving people many, many opportunities to deal with these um, tickets. Um, and, and, but ultimately, the solution is not to reduce the collateral damage of these enforcement policies, but to take a serious look at how they are enforcing the law. Are the police department's priorities in the right place? Should we spending, should we make, be making 30,000 arrests a year, even 20,000 arrests a year for marijuana, or should the police be doing other things on the streets? There has been talk, I mean, the suggestion has been made in, in terms of uh, uh, 
taking steps to prevent police misconduct is requiring police officers to wear body cameras. Mm -hmm. um, do you support that and what's prevented the NYPD from doing that to this point? Well, the, the, the police department has announced a pilot program with body cameras. Um, I don't believe that it's yet been um, uh, begun. We support body cameras. We think, though, that, uh, and we certainly support a pilot project on body cameras, but body cameras are yet another double-edged sword. Nothing is free <laughs> when you come to technology. And uh, while the, the, the promise of recording without interruption what goes on is enormously helpful. The dangers posed to people's privacy, like what happens to the recordings of like people innocently going about their business? Uh, what happens when the cops go into somebody's house? What safeguards are going to be in place to ensure, you know, that, that the uh, cameras are not, uh, th that the footage is not retained uh, by the police department when it's not necessary for a criminal investigation um, and that it doesn't improperly end up on the internet, as has happened with police videos in the past. Seriously? Certainly. Oh, yeah. There was a, um, uh, there was a notorious example uh, some years ago where a, um, uh, the, the video camera in one of the housing projects captured a man committing suicide. That footage ended up on some SNM site on the internet, uh, and and we don't know. Nobody knows how the police department safeguards uh, its footage and when it destroys it. And those safeguards need to be in place. Mm -hmm. There has been an escalating number of reports of incidents of mistreatment of inmates at Rikers Island, like in the last couple of years. I'm talking about inmates who've been beaten, sometimes gang beaten, by correction officers who've been hogtied, whose appeals for medical care have been ignored, mentally ill uh, inmates whose distress has been ignored, at least one who died in overheated cell, inmates who've been subjected to long periods of solitary confinement. I mean, it sounds like something from a, a 1930s movie, prison, prison movie. How did it get so bad? And who, if anyone, is doing anything to improve these conditions? Yeah, I would say Dickensian is an understatement when it comes to Rikers Island. And, uh, you know, we have met with the commissioner a number of times about the conditions. You know, first off, we have to get rid of solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is torture. And by the way, you know, if anybody doesn't believe that, you should go see Rosewater, John Stewart's new movie. I mean, it's about a lot more than that, but but the the the, the torture, you know, and the agony of solitary confinement comes through there as well. Um, uh, you know, but but you know, the the jail, the people who run the jails have to be able to maintain order. They have to protect inmates from the guards. Um, they have to protect them from other inmates who may be violent. Um, they have to have services for people who have mental illness. Which and, is a and lot of people in the prison, probably the majority. percentage. And the, and the mental health services are abysmal at Rikers. Um, and, and Rikers Island doesn't have the array of programs that are absolutely essential for prisoners to have a quality of life. And, you know, there, there, are, there are humane reasons, humanitarian reasons why you should have rehabilitation programs for prisoners and why you should have therapy available for prisoners who need it. Um, but there are also law and order reasons for that, because if you have privileges for prisoners, then you can take them away as punishment, and you're not putting yourself in the position where the only thing you can do if somebody breaks the rules or is violent is throw them into um, solitary confinement. Uh, we're pleased that, that Commissioner Pont has gotten rid of the, this, this um, uh, uh, overtime uh, policy where if you get out of Rikers, if you get out of solitary confinement into the public, you're discharged um, and you owe 20 days in solitary. If you're ever rearrested, you go back in solitary. 
<laughs> on oh a new goodness. crime. Which th so they got rid of that ridiculous yeah. um, uh, uh, policy. And there is, you know, there have been um, talks about plans in place. You know, they're they're getting rid of solitary for kids. Um, uh, by the end of the year, uh, there's a new unit for transgender inmates. But you got to remember, Rikers Island is either pretrial detainees or people who are serving time up to a year. Up to a right. year. That means misdemeanors, not serious crimes. Right. And but nobody goes into Rikers Island and emerges unscarred. Yeah. And so, so I think that that it takes time. I think that the mayor has to support efforts to provide substantial mental health programming and we have to hold the guards accountable you know the guards have 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 been um, uh, as much the source of the problem as anything else. The failure to ensure that guards who beat up inmates are held accountable are out of a job. I don't care what process the union requires. They have to be out of a job. They can't be near inmates uh, because because they're, 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 this is torture. Yeah. You know, to put to deprive somebody of their liberty and subject them to the abuse that that has been documented at right. Rikers. And it's about the kids who were there, but it's also about um, uh, the adults. And one way to sort of of like avoid um, uh, a part of the problem is bail reform. There's a huge percentage of people at Rikers because they can't afford $500 or less bail. It's time for bail reform yeah. so that people are not needlessly spending time in this miserable place. We're going to take a break. I'll be back with Donna Lieberman, Executive Director of the New York Civil Liberties Union, after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Donna Lieberman, Executive Director of the New York Civil Liberties Union. In the last couple of years, it seems that have been more and more cases of people who were wrongly convicted and had spent a lot of time in prison who have been exonerated and released uh, in, in New York City, and also, um, a number of settlements uh, that the city has paid out to people who have been, who were wrongly incarcerated for 16, 20, 20 years. Um, and it sounds like these settlements are being reached more quickly. Uh, finally, the Central Park Five got there, I think 40, $40 million settlement, but that case had been going on for years. And that just in the last few months, there have been a number of big settlements. Uh, on behalf of people who had been wrongly incarcerated. Is, why is this happening now? Is it that the mayor and maybe uh, the Brooklyn DA, for one, who are more attuned to these kinds of injustices and trying to do something about it? Yeah, I think that, that Mayor de Blasio inherited <clears throat> many, many cases um, that were the product of uh, bad police practices. And um, the, you know, uh, too widespread disrespect for people's rights. And um, it's instead of um, uh, digging in and fighting tooth and nail against every one of these cases, it's Mayor, de Blasio, uh, Mayor de Blasio has, has um, you know, given instructions, I believe, to um, resolve these cases. Um, it certainly looks like that. And he resolved, you know, the, the city has, since de Blasio came in, We've resolved the stop and frisk lawsuits, um, three, two, two of the major class actions, and a third, you know, on the way, I believe. Um, they've resolved the Central Park Five case and others. And so I think it's important for the city to, you know, step back and instead of litigating something to death, to sort of look at, well, were we wrong here? Um, and so I think that explains it um, in part. Um, uh, you know, the Central Park the Central Park Five case is um, instructive in so many ways, but one point I want to make about it is that that you know we have been pressing for years now for the police department to undertake the videotaping of all custodial interrogations. Everybody who is interrogated by the NYPD should be captured from beginning to end on videotape, not just when they're confessing, if they're confessing, but all the way through so that the jurors, if need be, so that the lawyers, if, it, you know, if need be, 
can see what actually went on and judge for themselves, was this coercion or was this truly voluntary? And I don't understand why that hasn't happened. Um, in the, the, the Central Park Jogger case, it People would have People have been helped. pushing for it for years, right? We have been pushing for it for years. And, you know, the NYPD loves technology. They never met a camera they didn't want to use, except when it comes to videotaping interrogations. They do it elsewhere. Prosecutors love it. Mm -hmm. It helps them make or not you know, or break the cases. Right. You know, when you right. want justice, not convictions, but justice, right. this is a no-brainer. So, so... Is the union fighting it? Um, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer. We are pressing for the <coughs> commissioner to, um, to um, implement videotaping. I think everybody's a winner there. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, and the, the other sort of um, not so obvious use of the videotaping is for training purposes. You know, how, how perfect to have examples of good interrogations and improper ones. Right. So. Um, last week, uh, President Obama announced a number of uh, immigration law reforms, uh, which he made unilater unilaterally as the executive uh, without the consent of Congress. What do you think of these reforms and the fact that he made them unilaterally? Well, the president has enormous authority to determine how our immigration laws are enforced. And, um, uh, you know, the reforms announced by the president uh, last week are not a substitute for comprehensive immigration reform. It's about time that the country built by immigrants on the shoulders of immigrants and, 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 and led by people whose parents were immigrants um, uh, should, should, you know, open up open our arms to people who are here only because they want to be able to provide for their families, who want to be constructive and, and contributing members of society. Um, this will help an enormous number of people. Millions of people will be able to come out of the shadows, at least for the time being. Um, you know, prior to this, um, president Obama has deported, you know, like more people than any other president. Uh, I don't exactly understand why he did that. Um, uh, it's hard to fathom uh, because it's caused so much pain and was so much so unnecessary. It wasn't about deporting, you know, violent criminals. It was about really breaking up families. Um, and so we hope that this will be the beginning of, you know, real change in our immigration policies. Um, and maybe it'll help bring Congress to its senses. Does Congress have senses? I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, you recently released uh, the. Uh, the Civil Liberties Union recently released the results of a survey that found that one in five school districts in New York State, including, you know, our own, are illegally refusing to enroll immigrant children because they can't, can't um, uh, produce certain documents. Mm -hmm. And that's unlawful. That's against the law. So these school districts are just blatantly disobeying the law? Well, you know, uh, yeah. Um, but not in New York City. In New York City, there is not the reliance on improper um, uh, documentation. Um, and, uh, but, but outside of New York City, um, school districts require sometimes, you know, documentation to prove uh, residence and immigration status. All they, can prove, all they can require is documentation of where you live. Mm -hmm. That's what they're allowed to ask for. They cannot ask you your, res your immigration status. They cannot insist that you prove that you're born here or that you're here legally. They have to enroll you. Every child um, in the state of New York and in the country has the right to go to school, regardless of whether they're um, born here or they're, or they're brought here from another country. And, and what happens to the children who come here, particularly the surge kids who have come from Central America recently, um, is even when they are allowed to enroll in school, um, too many school districts are trying to just warehouse them. Um, and it's incumbent on the Which state. Which when you say warehouse? Just stick them in the auditorium, you I know, see. or we don't know what grade they're in, so put them in ninth grade. That's not fair. That's not appropriate. Teachers know how to assess where kids are at. So there needs to be, you know, support from the state government, from the state education department to ensure that, that every school district understands 
what its obligation is, that every child who is at risk, who is coming here and, 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 and needs to enroll in school knows what their rights are. If you are an immigrant and you want to enroll in school, you have a right to do so, and the school district under federal law, McKinney-Vinto, um, um, uh, has the obligation of establishing that you can't if they want to deny you, that you're not properly there. And immigrants are transitional um, uh, residents. Uh, they have the right to go to school. So um, you know, the other issue you know, in the schools that we have been dealing with a lot is the criminalization of school discipline. And um, there's, there's, we have in New York City, uh, for over a decade of the Bloomberg administration, arrested kids for things like um, disorderly conduct or writing on the desk. And kids get summonses for which they have to go to court. And then um, uh, if they don't go to court, bench warrant, Rikers Island. And it's crazy. Um, and, and this is primary for high school students, I would imagine. Well, you would imagine, but it's actually um, uh, only high school students can get summonses, but junior high school kids can get arrested as well. And, and that, along with the excessive use of suspensions for kids who have disciplinary issues, and by the way, the overwhelming majority are kids of color, and within those groups, a disproportionate number of, are kids with special needs. Mm -hmm. So our system of school discipline is, is really um, um, uh, wrong. It puts power in the hands of police officers who are not trained to, to, to to educate children, it disempowers educators, and it really hurts the kids. Kids need support, they need a nurturing and safe learning environment, and they needed to be helped to, 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 to mend their ways, to grow up. Mm -hmm. um, that's what school has to be So what do you do, about. and we've just got maybe a minute left, what do you, what do, you do with a kid mm -hmm. who is just really repeatedly disruptive? Yeah, I think that there are positive behavioral reinforcements that, that, that can be offered, and there are trained professionals to do that. If a child is disruptive in the classroom so the kids can't learn, yes, the child can be removed from the classroom, but what do you do with that child? Do you throw the child into suspension for six months, or are there mental health services? We don't have any meaningful mental health services in our schools. So that's a challenge for the um, de Blasio administration. The, the Bloomberg administration did a terrible disservice to our children by criminalizing misbehavior in school, mm -hmm. and we have a lot to do to fix it. Sounds like you have a full plate. We sure do. <laughs> We've just scratched the surface. <laughs> okay, <today. laughs> well, next time we'll talk, about, we'll talk about what else is on your plate. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Donna Lieberman, Executive Director of the New York Civil Liberties Union, for joining me. If you'd like more information about the organization, check out its website at nyclu.org. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.